Good morning, church family and ministry friends. I'm Pastor Stephen Brooks. Welcome today to our online internet around the world church service. And I'm so glad that you are here today. Praise God. My friends, look at a very beautiful verse with me in Psalm 20 and drop down to verse four. We're going to receive the tithes and offerings. And I want you to see this beautiful promise from the Lord, something that is your inheritance and it belongs to you. Psalm 20 verse four, may he grant you according to your heart's desire and fulfill all your purpose. The NIV says, may he give you the desire of your heart and make all your plans succeed. English standard version, may he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. Praise the Lord. The CSB, may he give you what your heart desires and fulfill your whole purpose. The Holman Christian Standard Bible, may he give you what your heart desires and fulfill your whole purpose. Praise the Lord. My friends, the Lord wants the desire of your heart to be accomplished in your life. And the plans that he has placed into your heart, sometimes we call it destiny, or we could call it your assignment. But everything that's involved with that, God wants all of your plans to succeed. There is an imbalanced teaching that is sometimes presented where there is an overemphasis on suffering and overemphasis on hardship. And what happens is that a believer will begin to lose their joy. My friends, you know that you're healthy spiritually when the joy of the Lord is your strength. So there can be some ministers and they, they can be good ministers, but sometimes some tried to push a little too hard in the sense of carrying uh, weights or like burdens that they put too much emphasis on that when the Lord wants us to walk in his joy because the joy of the Lord is your strength. And it's actually a fruit of the Holy spirit. And my friends, one of those things that makes you happy that keeps joy flowing is seeing those things checked off, like with a big green check mark in your life that God wants you to accomplish and that God wants you to do and things that make you happy, even a desire of the heart, God brings those to pass. Woo. Praise the Lord. So we want to balance those scriptures were like Jesus said, take up your cross, which is an instrument of self crucifixion. Take up your cross and follow me. We want to balance that. For example, with Psalm 20 verse four, where God says that he wants to give us the desire of our heart and fulfill all of our plans. Wow. That's very, very powerful. And there's multiple verses in the Bible that instruct us that God wants to bring the past, the desire, sometimes even says the desires of your heart. Now, as we bring the tithe and the offering into the storehouse of the Lord, I want you to give in faith as you honor the Lord with your tithe, bring it in knowing that that desire of your heart, God's going to bring that to pass. And I want you to put faith on that, that as you're honoring the Lord with your finances, you are giving in faith and you are believing Psalm 20 verse four, that that desire is going to happen in your life and you're going to hold it in your hand or you're going to see it manifested in your life and you're going to experience it. You're going to laugh. You're going to enjoy the product, the outcome of your faith, praise God. And you're going to know the goodness of the Lord and all of your plans are going to succeed. God wants you to have the right theology. He wants you to have the theology that is centered around righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Any type of message that would try to carry you off into gloom or a very pessimistic attitude or outlook about life, that is not 
the gospel. Jesus said that I came that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And the word life in the original Greek is the word zoe, Z-O-E, and it actually means the quality of life that God knows. It actually means the God kind of life. And so God wants you happy. God wants good things happening in your life. And my friends, one day we'll reach heaven and it'll be all joy. It'll be all bliss. Praise God. But God wants you to have heaven while you're here on the earth and to reflect that, that faith, that strength to others and to, to demonstrate the gospel. Praise the Lord. Now, as we're again, as we're bringing the tithes and offerings into the storehouse of the Lord, do so in faith and attach to your faith, Psalm 20, verse 4, that God is giving you that very special thing. He's going to do it for you. The desire of your heart and all of your plans are going to succeed. Woo! Praise God. Hallelujah. Now, let's honor the Lord. For those of you that are bringing your tithes and in, your tithes and offerings in through the regular mail, please send them to Stephen Brooks International, P.O. Box 717. Moravian Falls, North Carolina, the zip code 28654. Now, if you want to bring your tithe and your offering in online, you can do so from anywhere in the world. As long as you've got internet, you can do it. Just go online to stephenbrooks.org. There's a link on the homepage that says give. It has a red heart. You can click that and you can bring your tithe in from anywhere on this big planet. Praise God. And if you want to give an offering above the 10% of your tithe, then you can click that orange banner that says projects. You'll see the various projects. You'll see the pure gold TV. And that actually helps us to preach the gospel around the world to broadcast three times every week from Bethlehem to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and as well as the other very large uh, uh, platforms that we are on, sending the gospel into over 200 nations of the world through television. So thank you for your, your offering on top of your tithe. It does help us to uh, hurl the word, the word of God to the most remote parts of the world, as well as to your cell phone or your laptop or your uh, tablet, whatever you're watching this on, or TV. Praise God, whether it's through Roku or whatever it might be. Okay. So let me pray over your giving father. I pray for your people that as they're honoring you with the tithe, 10% of their income as they're sowing seed, giving offerings. I just thank you, father God, that Psalm 20 verse four is in their faith repertoire and they are seeing hearts desire manifested. I thank you, father God, that they'll They'll have some of those, as we would say, trophies on the shelf. They're going to have those beautiful moments where these things manifest. We give you all of the praise. I thank you, Father, let all of the plans of your people succeed. I thank you that your sheep, oh God, hear your voice. They know the guidance of your Holy Spirit. They're dialed in, and all of their plans are going to succeed. In Jesus' name, amen. Shout amen. That means so be it. Praise God. All right. Let's take our Bibles and go over to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, and check out what was going on with Jesus and this fig tree situation. Very, very important message. Praise God. Let's pray. Father, as we study the words of Jesus, we thank you that Jesus meant what he said, but his words are so simple that sometimes we fail to make the proper application of it. And sometimes we don't really catch the spirit behind it. So we would ask today, Father, that anything that would try to block it, whether it's intellectualism or, or the, the human mind trying to reason it away, Father, just let the light of understanding come on today within our hearts. Thank you, Father God. And let faith come alive as it does as we hear your word. We thank you. We thank you for this work of your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. And we say, Amen. Today I'm talking about the subject of determined to taste the grapes. And I know that you're going to do that. God's not dangling grapes out in front of you to tease you. He is showing you what rightfully belongs to you, what Jesus paid such a tremendous price for on Calvary, a price that really is beyond our comprehension to understand what he went through to redeem us back to God. 
and we are able to see what God has available for us and we step into it and we move towards it and it's all because Jesus has made provision for us. Praise God. Now Mark chapter 11, let's begin today in verse 12. Now the next day when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. Here, of course, we see the Lord's divinity. You do need to know that Jesus is God. Jesus has always been God. He is the second person of the Godhead deity. I, I have actually heard, uh, it's, it's kind of rare, but I have actually heard some ministers say that Jesus was not God. That's, that's first class stupid. Uh, and it's also blasphemy. My friends, Jesus is just as much God as the Heavenly Father is. Jesus is just as much God as the Holy Spirit is. One God, three distinct persons within the Godhead. Sometimes we call it the Trinity. The Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is 100% God, yet a divine mystery, 100% men. We know that He was born through the Virgin Mary into the earth as a man. So he's a hundred percent man, yet he's a hundred percent God. And we also have to be fair because we know that he laid the God power down and he had to, because if he's going to redeem lost mankind back to God, he has to do it as a man. Why? Because if he tried to do it as God, the first one that's going to jump up and say, you can't do it that way is going to be Satan because Satan defeated a man. And if somebody's going to win it back, you're going to have to win it back as a man. You're going to have to operate on that platform. And so Jesus is, of course, going to play by the rules because God always does. <laughs> it's, it's the devil who's a cheater and a deceiver who doesn't play by the rules, who's a liar and a swindler. And of course, anytime you cheat later, that's going to cause a lot of problems down the road. And the devil certainly has enough problems facing him down the road, such as in eternity in the lake of fire. But my friends, here we see that Jesus was hungry. So we see his humanity displayed. Other times we see that he got tired physically. Now verse 13, and seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see it. Perhaps he would find something on it. And the leaves would be an indicator that there should be fruit because if there's no fruit, yet the tree has leaves, something's wrong. We have a, we have a tree that's actually a hypocrite. So we can't let the tree off the hook here. Uh, if you've got the leaves, this is the rule of thumb. You should have the fruit corresponding with that. He went to see it. Perhaps he would find something on, on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. Well, in verse 14, we see that Jesus responds to that tree. In response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. They heard this statement. Sometimes people say that he cursed the fig tree. Well, in our culture, in our society today, if you said somebody cursed, you would think that they used profanity. They, they were saying some kind of awful, you know, uh, dirty word. But technically, you could say that he pronounced a curse or a judgment over it, but he didn't curse. We understand that. But I know that we have many young believers in the Lord that watch. And so we want to explain what it is that we say. So Jesus spoke to it and said, let no one eat fruit from, from you ever again. So he pronounced a death sentence upon that tree. Now we know that the scripture says that Jesus was filled with the spirit without measure. So Jesus has an unlimited anointing resting upon him. The Holy Spirit is upon him very, very powerfully. And so we're going to see very quick results. And Peter is going to be the first to notice it amongst the 12 apostles. But my friends, what Jesus did that took place overnight you can do, and you may not have results that quickly against negative circumstances or against mountain type situations that Jesus is going to elaborate on. But I'm telling you that if you will stay with it and 
keep working these principles, you may not get like a result within 12 hours or 24 hours, but you could get it within 72. You could get it perhaps within uh, two weeks, maybe three months, but it will work for you. Jesus said that it would. Let's drop down now to verse 20. Now in the morning as they passed by. So this is only the next day. So this is a very short time frame that we're looking at. As they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. So it's dead. And it's not something where, you know, the leaves at the tip began to, you know, fade out. No, it got hit at the source, at the roots, and it began to die and wither immediately. Now, you may not have seen the result of that, like if you stood next to that tree within three minutes, maybe you couldn't like uh, outwardly instantly tell what had happened. But the moment he spoke that word to that tree, the tree's finished. Praise God. Now he's going to get into the area of mountains, but you have to see that what Jesus did to that tree, you could do to that disease that's attacking your body. You could speak to the cancer and it will, it will die just like the fig tree died if you meet the criteria that the Lord is going to lay out in verses 22, 23, and 24. Praise God. Verse 21, and Peter remembering said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. Now, I'm glad he didn't just leave it at that, because then we really wouldn't understand what this God type of faith actually is. But he he's going to define it for us in the next verse, the following statement that he gives. Basically, this is what it is. The God kind of faith is the kind of faith that believes in the heart and then speaks it. That's it. We don't have to... Uh, build a rocket ship and go to Mars to try to figure it out. It's not that technical. Praise God. It's not technical. It's very, very simple. The God kind of faith is you believe it in your heart. You believe the word. And then because you do believe it, you do what you speak it. Woo. Praise God. So let's take a look at it here. He said, have faith in God for assuredly. Now in the Greek, Teachers of New Testament Greek tell you that there is no stronger word in the entire Greek language that can be pulled from to make an adamant statement that this is absolute, complete, total truth. So when he says, assuredly, he is saying this is beyond any doubt. This is beyond any argument. This works for anybody, anywhere. This is 100% Heavy duty, complete, raw truth. And that's what is being emphasized in that word when he says, for assuredly. He's not just throwing that in there because we've got to fill the Bible up with more words. Every word is inspired by the Holy Spirit. For, in, for assuredly, I say to you, and that means also to you and I, put your hand on your heart and say, Jesus is talking to me today. For assuredly, I say to you, Whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. Praise the Lord. Now here's something fascinating that we need to extract from this statement that Jesus just made. And it may help you to take a pen I've got it highlighted with different colors, but let's just make it easy. Take a pen and in verse 23, underline every time you see the word says, S-A-Y-S. Let's do it right now. Please grab your Bible. Do it right now with me. For surely I say to you, whoever says, there's the first one, underline that. Whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes in those things he says. There's number two. Underline that one right there. Will be done. He will have whatever he says. There's number three. Whatever he says. There's, there's three. 
Okay, so what we're looking at is that Jesus mentions the word says three times. Now watch this. Let's underline how many times he uses the word believe. Okay? For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes. There's one. There we go. But believes that those things he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. Let's do some deep math today. What is the ratio between the words says and the word believe? What is the ratio? It's three to one. Okay, watch this. It's three to one. So here is the area many Christians miss it. They believe in their heart what God has said. And believe is on the scale of a three to one ratio. So they, they believe. They've got the believing down good. But Jesus puts the emphasis on on a ratio of three to one of saying. Why? Because saying is the expression of your faith. So he says, believe only one time, but he says, say three times. And that's where many believers, they miss it. They, they actually say they believe, but they don't say what it is. They believe. They just say, I believe. Pastor Stephen, I believe God. What do you believe? Well, I I just believe God. (laughs) But you, if you really do believe God, then you have to say what you believe and you open your mouth and speak it out. Wow. Praise the Lord. In other words, if you don't talk to the mountain, it's not going to move and you know what it'll do. This is amazing. If you don't talk to the mountain, it will stay there and it will talk to you for the rest of your life. Pastor Stephen, what will will the mountain say? It will say, I'm not going anywhere. I might just be the one that kills you, whether it's cancer, heart disease, liver problem, kidney problems, migraine, unexplainable migraines or depression or whatever it might be whatever it might be, addiction to a certain type of thing. That thing is a mountain and it will talk to you and say, I'm in your life. I'm too big for you and I'm not going anywhere. You might as well just learn to live with me. Did you ever notice that mountains talk? Well, Pastor Stephen, you've got a pretty good point. They do. Well, since they do, why don't you talk to them? Well, now, Pastor Stephen, that's being, that's being biblical. Have you ever thought about that? That's being biblical to talk to it because it's talking to you. So you need to talk to it for a, on a, on a scale or on a ratio of three to one regarding what you believe. Wow. Praise God. Mm, 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 mm. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You have to talk to the mountain and you have to command it to get up and get out of your life. Let's do it for an example. Let's take an example. There's probably at least one or two of you out there that might be in this boat. So let's do this together. Let's, let's speak to debt just for a moment. Pastor Stephen, everybody watching you is debt free. Well, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The giving should go up dramatically. (laughs) Right? Because if you're not in debt, that means all of that money that you no longer have to pay on interest or pay off on this or that, it's now freed up, praise to God. So you should be able to have more money for savings, more money for purchases, and more money for giving for the kingdom of the Lord. All right, different subject though. Watch this. Watch how you work it. Okay. You speak to the mountain. Let's take debt, for example. And you say, debt, be removed out of my life and be cast into the sea. And what did Jesus say would happen? He said, if you believe it in your heart, it'll be done for you. It's going to happen. Mm -mm. So first of all, you have to believe that God wants you to be debt free. (laughs) 
<laughs> right? Praise the Lord. I mean, he said, I'll make you the head and not the tail. I'll make you the lender, not the borrower. So you might not want to be a lender from the perspective that you go out and open a bank, but you certainly don't want to be, you know, the person that's just buried in debt and stuff like that. You want to be free. Well, Pastor Steve, I have a problem. What's the problem? I have a mountain of debt. Oh, so you have a mountain after all, huh? What does it say? It says, I won't be, it says, I'm not going anywhere for the next 20 years because the interest is so high that as you make your minimal payment, it doesn't even move me. So I'm going to be here for a while. Well, you know what to do. First of all, you control your spending habits and you get that under control. You get that submitted. You always want to honor the Lord, give your tithe. Okay. So seed. Okay. And you also want to set some money aside and you want to honor the Lord with your finances. Hallelujah. You want to, be, you want to save. But if you've, got, if you've got that debt problem sticking around, you need to talk to it and talk to it strong. Jesus didn't say to the fig tree, you, you, you don't have no fruit. Well, you, 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 you leave. Get out, get, get out of here. Go away. <laughs> I think those men, those 12 apostles would have laughed at him. No, Jesus spoke to the fig tree and said, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And by the next day it's toast. And we know technically from the moment he spoke it, boom, it got struck with the power of those words and it's finished. And what you need to do is, is you need to speak to the mountain and realize it may not move within 24 hours, but as you keep operating in faith, operating in faith and discipline your spending habits, but as you keep operating in faith and speaking to that mountain, you can blast that thing out of there and it will get up and get thrown into the sea and keep talking to it. Debt in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, get out of my life, be thrown in the sea. I call you paid off in full in the name of the Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Praise the Lord. And Jesus said, if you do that and you do not doubt in your heart, you believe that what you say will be done, you're going to have whatever you say. Amen. And it could be, it could be that God starts blessing you in special ways and things start happening. However, God does it. That's God's job. But you, you could start chopping that thing down, chopping that thing down in an extra uh, expedited way. Or you could get blessed in some way. You could just pay the whole thing off at once and it's gone. It's gone. Somebody just, oh, it, it was a brother in Montana, Brother Keith. I, I read that recently, just gave me his testimony where the hospital canceled his bill. And it was a past bill, a very large bill. And the hospital just canceled it. Whole thing's paid off. And they told him, we're going to pay your ongoing treatments for you. We're going to cover it. Wow. Praise the Lord. So miracles happen. We believe in miracles. We're open, wide open for God to step in and do the miracle. And at the same time, these are miraculous principles that work. Again, he said, for assuredly, with the most emphatic truth, I'm telling you that this works. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So you need to use your faith and stay on this. Stay on it. Praise the Lord. Let's go into verse 24. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask, and I know there's things that you ask God for, things that you need, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Okay, let's do this in the order that Jesus said so that we can get the results that Jesus said will be producing for those that work it according to what he said. Now, let me read it again real slow, real slow. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them. When? Three months from now, Pastor Stephen. No, that's not in the Bible. He did not say that. Picture yourself standing there with the twelve as Jesus meant this for all of his followers, and Jesus is saying this. When is he talking about that you believe that you receive? Well, I guess when it shows up, that's when we believe we receive. No, when, you've, when it showed up and you're holding it, you don't need faith then. You've already got it. No, when do you believe 
that you receive it. You do it when you pray that prayer. When you pray that prayer and say, amen. Look, you have to pray in faith. We're not just praying because let's just go through religious emotions that don't produce anything. No, we're praying to get our prayers answered. So he said, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them. Believe that you receive them right then. Faith is always now. It's not like, well, later, later we'll believe we'll receive it. Now, look, you will, you're going to get it later, but you, you have to believe that you've got it when you pray. Again, a lot of Christians, they, they get very um, emotional. They, they're, they're governed by their feelings, and they say, well, I'll believe it when I feel it. What in the world does your feelings have to do with it? The Apostle Paul said, we walk by faith, not by feelings. Now, he said, we walk by faith, not by sight, but sight is a representation of our five physical senses. In other words, you don't walk by how you feel. You don't walk by, you know, like what's going on with your body or something like that, or what, what we even call symptoms. You walk by faith in God's word. So when you pray, you believe when you pray that God has heard that is taking place, that it's done, and that is your position. What happens when you hold that position? You get the end of the verse, and you will have them. Well, Pastor Stephen, I'll believe it when I've got it. Oh, you want to get back in the Thomas group, the doubting Thomas? <laughs> he said, I'm not going to believe it until I see it. That's the doubting Thomas group. But Jesus corrected him and said, you must first. Now, look, this is the kingdom. I know this is new for some of you. Because maybe you're a brand new Christian, or maybe you've been, uh, you've been raised in church, but you were raised in a lot of tradition, and it was, it was really a lot of man-made religion, okay? But in the kingdom of God, you have to believe it first, and then you see it. If you say that you have to see it first, there's no faith involved in that. And I, I feel for those who've missed out on this because they really, in many ways, they don't know how faith actually works. And, and in America, you can get away with that for a while because we have plenty of jobs. We have the most stable currency in the world. We have good uh, hospitals. We've got uh, all kinds of free stuff. You know, even if you're having a hard time, you can just apply for this or that. So... In a lot of ways, it's not like, you know, you, you, in other words, you can slide by, but, but if you hit, if you hit a moment, uh, and you're in something where suddenly you need to have real faith on the line that actually works. And, uh, and now you're having to really believe God. And the next thing you know, now you got all these feelings, you got all these circumstances and you don't, you don't know how to walk it out. So I'm trying to tell you that regardless of where you live at in the world, um, this scripture is, it's non-discriminatory in the sense that it will work for anybody that will take a hold of it and believe it. Praise God. But in order to do that, you've got to believe that you've got it now. When you pray right then, and Jesus says, now if you do that, and you will have them. Mm, 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 mm. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Sometimes people say, when I see the money show up, I'll believe it. Well, if the money shows up and there it is, well, it, now, now it's here. It's not like there's anything to believe. You're, it's, it's in your hand. It's not so much that you believe it. It's like now you know it. Well, so you don't, you don't need to exercise faith. Why would you exercise faith for something that you're holding in your hand that's yours? No, you have to believe it first, especially in these areas where you need God's help. That's why you're praying, because you're going before God saying, God, uh, I can't do this. I need you to step in and, uh, you know, uh, and help. And you're certainly able to help. So God, come on in here and uh, do what you do. Amen. Praise God. But in order for God to do that, he's. He's going to look at you, and he wants to see that you believe before it's manifested. You must believe you've got it. When? Right now. Not, not three weeks later, not, not, you know, three months later. Right now. Thank you, Jesus. Sometimes people say, well, Pastor Stephen, I, 
I've prayed and I've asked God to heal me. Okay, good. Stand on the scripture. Now put your faith to work. Well, now hold on, Pastor Stephen. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to believe it when I, when I could, when these symptoms leave. Well, why do you need to believe it then? Because then you would have it. <laughs> so they keep waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and nothing ever changes. The mountain never leaves. Praise the Lord. My friends, we have to do it the way Jesus said. Now it's very, very simple. It's very, very simple. I think it's the state of Missouri. I drove through Missouri last year, and I think their state motto is, it's the show me state. And uh, maybe that's the motto for some Christians. Show it to me, God, and then I'll believe it. Show me first, and then I'll believe. Well, we need to have a believer's motto, which is, I believe, and then you'll see it. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. God is good, and God is working right now. When you pray, believe that you have whatever things you ask. Now, this is very, very important. Please listen very carefully just for a moment. Begin to say it from your heart that you've got it. I thank God. I thank God I've got this. Praise God. Begin to say it from your heart. And here's what will happen. When you believe, when you believe it and you begin to say it, you know, your mind might uh, have struggles with it. And that's totally fine because faith is in here, right? I'm pointing to my heart. Faith is in the heart, the recreated human spirit. Faith is not intellectual. It's not in your head, but your mind may struggle. But even if you don't really believe it, or even if you struggle with it, start saying it anyhow. And what will happen is that you can instruct yourself into faith. That's what I want you to catch. Now I'm going to say that again. You can look at the teachings of Jesus and you can say, I know it's true, but it's so new to me. It's so revolutionary to me that I'm having trouble believing it. Even if you don't fully believe it, start saying it anyhow, and you can instruct yourself into faith. You can actually school or teach yourself into faith. This is how the kingdom works. And the next thing that happens as you start saying it, you actually start to sense like, yeah, this is actually releasing faith. I've had faith in me because every believer has the measure of faith. And so as you start to speak it, you start to exercise that measure and you're like, ah, now I see what Jesus is talking about. Now I'm beginning to understand what Pastor Stephen is teaching. I have to believe it. But again, and this is part of my responsibility Believing is on the three to one ratio. You'll have to put the emphasis, the weight on doing the what speaking, because that's really where you you're now starting to make application of what you believe. So that's actually like, uh, believing is like crafting an exercise plan, speaking it, which is the release of your, of what it is you believe speaking. It is like the equivalent of now going to the gym and actually moving the weights or now getting on the treadmill, turning it on, and now actually walking, or whatever it might be. It's at, that's the part where you, you have to go to work. And that's, the, that's where we can find ourselves spiritually lethargic. So remember, I know that you believe in your heart. Jesus knows it too. But you have to speak it. And you have to say, God is working mightily in my life. Mountain, get out of my life. Be thrown into the sea. Hallelujah. I call my debts paid off. I call my bills paid on time. And, and you may, you may have a mountain around you of debts. You may have negative circumstances where you're just trying, you're trying to get the bills paid. Okay. But my friends, you believe that God wants you blessed. You believe that Jesus has redeemed you from the curse of the law. He became poor that you might be rich. Okay. So you need to be, you need to be talking the right faith language so that you can start blasting those mountains, not celebrating the mountains, blasting them and seeing them thrown out of your life into the sea. Woo. Mm, 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 mm. Praise God. Now let's jump over to Hebrews chapter four, Hebrews chapter four. You'll find of course that you really have to work at this to keep your faith up because you could be real high one day, maybe two or three days in a row 
but then maybe the circumstances will kind of rear their head or maybe a weird, unexpected bill, and it will tempt you to speak in harmony or in agreement with the mountain. Uh, yeah, you're, you're hanging pretty tough. You don't look like you've gone anywhere yet. No, 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 don't do that. Build your faith up so that you can keep blasting the mountains and telling the mountain what to do instead of the mountain telling you what it's going to do. Praise God. And we see this in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. Let me grab a drink of hot tea real quick. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. So they did hear good preaching, good teaching, but they never took their faith and took a hold of it. And so they never got into what God had planned for them. For we who have believed do enter that rest as he has said. So I swore my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. And my friends, here's, here's what's very powerful. The works that God has called you to accomplish, the assignment that he has, from, that he has for your life, was already, in his mind, was already finished from the foundation of the world. He has given you the measure of faith. He has given you everything that you need through the name of Jesus and the blood of Jesus that has been invested into you. And there is no reason why you can't get it done. Amen. So you must rise up, believe in your heart, and speak in agreement with God's word, and the mountains will move. Verse 11, let us therefore labor to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Let me read this from a couple of other translations, because we want to step into what God has for us. I like the um, Christian Standard Bible. Let us then make every effort to enter that rest, so that no one will, fa will fall into the same pattern of disobedience. How were they disobedient? They never got into the promised land that God had for them. They just simply believed that God couldn't do it. And they spoke that negativity also all the time, every day. Negative, negative, negative talk. Mm -mm. Contemporary English version. We should do our best to enter the place of rest. So none of us will disobey and miss going there as they did. Hear me today from this pulpit in Moravian Falls, North Carolina. You will not miss it. You will accomplish all that God has called you to do, and that includes your desires of your heart that make you happy. Mm -mm. Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. So it's your strong faith that keeps you accurate and on target with the words you speak. That's why you have to labor in the word to find those scriptures that actually feed you. Just like food feeds the human body, gives you strength. You have to find preaching and teaching and scriptures that feed you so that you can accomplish your assignment. Mm -mm. Praise God. And so that you also keep speaking in agreement with this power confession to blow those mountains up. Amen. Hallelujah. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 2. You are snared by the words of your mouth. This is a, a statement in the context of something that a man has spoken when he should have not had said certain things. Therefore, he finds himself in verse 2. You are snared by the words of your mouth. You are taken by the words of your mouth. There are some Christians who, they seem to be stuck in a habit of blaming the devil for all of, their all of their trouble. Have you ever met some of them? They always blame it on the devil. When really, really, if you could look more thoroughly into the situation, it's actually their words that have gotten them into trouble. Mm -mm. My friends, please listen very carefully. Please don't ever talk failure. Even if you're going through very, very challenging times and the circumstances are very adverse, adversarial against your life, very negative and very difficult, please don't ever, ever talk failure. Don't ever, ever talk defeat. And don't for one moment 
ever verbalize that God can't put you over and give you the victory. And if you cannot speak words of faith, do anything but speak negativity. It's better just to be quiet and walk around all day long and just not really say anything. Even if you if you have all those negative emotions and feelings, and we all know what that is, and you feel that stuff trying to come against your soul and your spirit, if, if you're j just hold steady, and if you can't speak the strong word, stay silent, but don't sink your ship by saying words that agree with those horrible mountains. Cause it could be. It could be that that mountain is just about to crumble and fall into the sea. And, but the next thing you know, you just restrengthen it and replenished it by awful negative words. Don't do that. Don't do it. Blast the mountain and say in the name of Jesus, get up, get out of my life and be thrown into the sea. Praise God. God and call the mountain for what it is. If it's cancer, cancer, get up, get out of my body. You can't stay, get out of my body and be thrown into the sea. Whatever it is, blast it. Hallelujah. Blast it with powerful words and they're working. They are working. Mm -mm -mm. Just like those 12 walked by and saw that dead tree and commented on it. There will be people that walk by your life and see the radical change for good in your life. And they'll say, Whoa, uh, they'll, they'll comment on what has happened to you because the mountain's gone. Mm -mm. Praise God. Praise God. If you're talking failure and defeat, then you are in a sense, acknowledging that God can't do it for you. Instead of being failure conscious, become God conscious. Instead of being defeated, in your mentality, have a mentality of victory that greater is he that is in me that he, than he that is in the world. I'm more than a conqueror in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Woo. Can you see why the saying is so important? Because the strength of believing will lie in residency dormant unless you release it through the words you speak. Praise God. Very quickly, the book of Numbers, chapter 13. This year, this year is a year of faith, represented by the letter F. A year of understanding, represented by the number U. Pastor Stephen, what's next? Something that would represent D. Is this the year of FUD? No! This is the year of fun. Glory to God. Faith, understanding, Numbers. God's going to get you out of the red into the black, and you'll never go back. Praise God. In other words, you're moving forward financially. God's going to help you with your finances, but He needs your cooperation. He needs you to do the right thing with your tongue. Praise the Lord. Mm -mm. Numbers 13, verse 23. Then they came to the valley of Eshkol. Doesn't that sound beautiful? The valley of the gigantic grapes. And there are cut down a branch with one cluster of grapes. They carried it between two of them on a pole. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, Pastor Stephen, the promises of God are beautiful. Yeah, they really are. Amen. Sometimes God to give you a little preliminary test to see if you want to go in and make this not just a once in a lifetime moment, but make this your lifetime experience. Sometimes he'll give you a little, a little taste. Amen. Praise the Lord. They also brought some of the pomegranates and figs. Oh, that's nice to know those are growing there. The place was called the Valley of Eshcol because of the cluster which the men of Israel cut down there. And they returned from spying out the land after 40 days. Now they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the, of the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Everybody's all excited. Then they told him and said, we went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey. And this is its fruit. Of course it does. God said it did. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land, here we go. Watch out. Here we go. Watch that subtle turn. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. 
The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, the Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. Yeah, God told you there's, they're there, no big deal, okay? And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses. Why, were they, why did he have to quiet them? Because these ten goofballs got them all worked up in fear and pandemonium. Woo! And it spread like wildfire. They were about, several million people were about to have a complete breakdown, meltdown out there. Sobbing and a bobbing, weeping, wailing and a crying, a big fleshly display of emotions run wild and fear and paranoia gripping them. Woo, what a mess. And Joshua and Caleb, they, be, they do all they can to calm the situation down. Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once. My friends, if God said, go, I'm with you, and, the, and it's yours, why, why do we debate it? The only thing maybe we should debate or strategize is the, the techniques in which we'll use, because that's different for everybody, okay? But one thing's for sure, there ain't no debate about we're, whether we're going to do it or not. We're, that's not even open for discussion. We go. We go right now. Mm -mm. Faith is when? It's now. It's always in the now. Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And now watch verse 32. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out. You know what they did? They lied. They lied. Well, Pastor Stephen, they were just being honest. They lied. I present that to some of you, you've been lied to also. You have been told by old religious fuddy-duddies that you can't do it. You know why they said that? Because they're buried in mediocrity, and they're willing to die there in that barren land. And because they couldn't do it, they formed their theology around their self-defeatism, and they want to preach that to you because misery loves company. And these two stood up, and they told a lie. Woo! Mm -mm. Now, the New King James Version is very nice and only calls it a bad report. The Old King James Version, working off the Masoretic text, which is, I believe is a much better text, nails it and calls it an evil report. But if you dig it into the Hebrew, it's even worse. Mm -mm. In the Hebrew, this word bad, this word evil is the word debal. And it, re it means a report that is defaming. It, it's tied in with a slanderer, a liar. It is a defaming evil, slanderous report. It's inaccurate. Mm -mm. Right now, I want to ask a humble question. This is like voting. You go into your little voting booth and you vote. You pull the curtain. Nobody sees you. You're making your, you're making your vote for, you know, like president or governor or whatever it might be. Okay. This is your little moment. Go into your little private booth right now. It's you and God. Pull the curtain. It's just you and God. I've got to ask you a question. It can only go this way or that way. I want to ask you a question right now, right now, based on the way that you talk and the words that come out of your mouth right now, would you be found over there with those 10 goofballs or would you be found over here with Joshua and Caleb? I'm not looking behind your curtain. I'm not peeking behind your curtain. This is between you and God. I'm not casting stones. But a lot of times we read these phenomenal stories of real life experiences, but we dismiss ourselves from it and we think, oh, that's just way back then. Everything's different now because we're modern and now we have smartphones and we're different now. But the same thing happens over and over with each generation. We have to make up our choice. And often the minority or the smaller percentage are the ones that are actually pressing in and doing it. And it's based on words. 
Joshua and Caleb said, we can do it. Now, they not only said we can do it, they said we're well able. We're not only able, we are well able to do this. And it infuriated the others. Mm -mm. The other ten were full of negativity. And God said, it's not bad, it's evil. This is wickedness. This, they slandered and lied against God. Mm -mm. Who did the people believe? They sided with the ten. So sometimes you have to go uphill. That's why you have to keep your faith strong so that you can go uphill. Because there will be critics. There will be doubters. There will be those that are content in their failure. But, but you will inspire many. You will inspire many. Why? 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 Because you're not the only one who wants to taste the grapes. <laughs> Woo! Glory to God. Hallelujah. And sometimes, some, sometimes all people need to see is somebody that actually believes the Bible and is going after with boldness and faith what God already said rightfully is yours. No apologies offered. We're just going to obey God. And when you're obeying the Lord, by the way, you don't have to apologize for anything for doing what God said is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. All right, step out of your voting booth. Step out of your little private cubicle. Okay, look, if you realize, hey, uh, you know, Pastor Stephen, I love Jesus. I'm going, I know I'm going to heaven. But uh, yeah, yeah, a lot of time I, I would be found with those 10. I probably would be found talking along with them. If that's so, make the change. Where? Right here. Woo! Right here. Amen. Why? Why? Because of this. And this is what the Holy Spirit told me. You must learn to train and master your tongue and the words you speak in order to use your tongue to eventually taste the grapes of the land. Pastor Stephen, I want those grapes on my tongue. I want them on my, I want to taste it. God did put the taste buds on there for a purpose, right? Oh, oh, I want to taste them, Pastor Stephen. I'm sure they're good. Oh, they are good. But to taste it with your tongue, you've got to get your tongue talking the right stuff. And all this negativity and doubt of why you can't do it, of why blah, 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 this or that or the other, you've got to change it. You've got to change it. And if you make the change, then your tongue is really ready to taste Mm -mm. Lift your hands. Father, I pray for your people. I pray for your, your people. There'd be any defilement of words, negativity, glorifying the devil instead of giving you praise. I pray, Father God, that that be released now, that be broken off now, and that their tongue be sanctified and cleansed with holy fire. Oh God, that you would send angels from the heavenly realm with the seraphic coals of fire and touch their tongues, oh God, and bring purity and cleansing in the way they talk. I know, Father, many, of course, would not use profane words, what we would call profanity, but Father, when we speak unbelief, we belittle your deity and your power and your greatness. And we, we even participate, even if it's unknowing, in slanderous accusations that you're unable to do what you said you could do. Now, Father, I thank you for that cleansing in Jesus' name. Receive the fire of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is good. God is good. Praise the Lord. Amen. Now, let me pray for any that would be watching today, but you don't know the only mediator between God and man, who is Jesus. If you want to get saved, you want to go to heaven. There's no other way except through him. There's no other route, no other religion, no other person. He's the only mediator between God and man. He's Jesus. He's the bridge from lost humanity to God, to heaven. You ready to pray? If you're not right with God, I want you to pray this prayer. If you're a sinner, if you are a backslidden Christian and you're, you're fed up with your sin, you're ready to come out of that. Now is your time also to rededicate your life to the Lord. Both camps now pray this prayer. All sinners pray this prayer. Say, Jesus, come into my heart. I give my life to you. I repent of all of my sins and I ask you to forgive me and wash me with your blood. 
Jesus, I acknowledge you as Lord and Savior of my life. Write my name in your book of life and step into my life and lead me and guide me in this day forward. From this day forward, in your name I pray, amen and amen. God is good. God is good. Hallelujah. Lift your hands and give him praise. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Let's take Holy Communion. Grab some unleavened bread. I use these little crackers. If you don't have one of these, just use what you've got. Praise God. Even if it's a little piece of bread, just tear it off. A little cracker, whatever you have. And grab some grape juice. And let's pray. Father, we thank you for the bread and the juice. We bless it. We set it apart now as being holy. And we thank you that this is the bread, excuse me, the body and the blood of Jesus. Father, as we receive the Lord's flesh, we just thank you, O God, that Jesus meant what he said. We just thank you that we can have what we say. So, Father, help us to take that to heart. And speak in accordance always with your word. We thank you, Father, even like the saints of old, the Apostle Paul and King David, that we have the same spirit of faith. We believe, therefore we speak. Father, as we receive the Lord's flesh, we thank you for the grace to speak, to say. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's partake together. Hallelujah. Father, thank you for the blood of Jesus. Father, we thank you that in Christ there's no condemnation. Father, we, we have all, all as humans have misspoken, even after our salvation, after our redemption. We have all misspoken at times and said things that just came out because we are still learning to master our tongues. So, Father, we ask you for extra grace to keep a guard over our mouths to speak what is in harmony with your word, to speak words of love, to speak what would be the truth. We give you praise, O God. We thank you, Father God, to speak to the mountains. And we thank you, Father, for the cleansing blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We thank you, Father. We now receive his precious blood in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's drink together. Oh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. There's a healing anointing available right now. Please, again, lift your hands to the Lord Jesus. He wants to heal those watching right now. Lord Jesus, we give you praise. We thank you for your healing power. Somebody, your back, it's your lower back, right in this area, right here, God's healing your back. In the, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, muscle spasms be healed in the name of the Lord Jesus. I rebuke scoliosis up and down the spine. Loose them and leave them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we give you praise. Somebody, you have not had proper blood circulation in your feet, particularly in your toes. I speak to your, to your feet, be healed. Blood flow freely through the toes, through the feet, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Father God. God is he healing ears right now. If you have, what's that called? Tinnitus? The ringing in the ears. Put your hands up to your ears. Don't cover your ears. I want you to hear what I'm saying. But just touch your ears right now. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke tinnitus. I rebuke ringing in the ear. Loose them and come out. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Glory, glory to God. If you also listened excessively to loud music or loud sounds and you tolerated that 
you need to, you need to repent to the Lord and tell the Lord you're sorry for that. Okay. Work with that anointing that's flowing right now. Praise God in the name of the Lord Jesus. Oh God, we give you praise. Hallelujah. God is touching minds right now with the spirit of wisdom. Father, let the spirit of wisdom touch your people. I thank you, Father God. I thank you that all of your people are brilliant. I thank you, Father, that your people function in the anointing. I thank you for the oil of your spirit touching their minds right now. And that sin has no dominion over them. They walk in the perfect law of liberty. They walk in the law of love. I thank you, Father God. I thank you, God, Father God, for peaceful sleep for your precious people and energy to do all that you've called them to do. Now, Father, we give you all of the praise in Jesus' name. Those of you watching, you need God to touch your body. Just receive your healing touch now in Jesus' name. Receive. Take it by faith. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory. Glory to God. My friends, thank you for joining me today. I also want to say thank you for praying for me. I have felt your prayers. When I say I felt them, I, have, I can sense that many of you are praying for me. I know that, of course, you know that I'm, I'm on a fast, and I share that so that you can know because many of you, you know, you watch me and you see me, so I have to let my, my audience know what I'm doing because if I could go off in private and fast somewhere, I would. But since I have to do it publicly, then I have to let you know. And also because many others have joined with me on this fast as they're seeking the Lord, believing God for miracles and breakthroughs. But I want to say thank you for praying for me. I have felt the Lord's touch. I, I sense the strength of the Lord today by God's grace, number 16, and on we go. Praise the Lord. No food, drinking juice. You know, the thing about fasting, let me close by saying this, is that there will never be a convenient time in your life ever to fast. You just have to do it. If you keep waiting for when there's a time where there's no birthdays or there's no, there's no anniversaries or no parties or no, no this or that, it'll never happen. You just have to make a commitment to go ahead and start. It's like that old commercial that Nike made some time back. Just do it. You just start. You just drink your juice and you just do it and you just push through it and you just trust God for the grace and you just do it. Praise God. So for some of you, bless your hearts, you've overanalyzed fasting and all you need to do is just go do it. Just make a determination to start. Whether you say, I'm going to go for three days, whatever you might want to do just, uh, or 10 days, or maybe you just want to jump in with us and just, you know, do a few days to get closer to the Lord, whatever your heart is touched to do. But just do it, step into it, and just do it. It's not um, anything complicated. Just find out what works for you as far as what you need to drink. Some of that's kind of fun as you experiment and you, uh, you know, realize what works good with your body, what gives you the energy. Praise the Lord. I primarily just drink um, apple juice, water, and some coffee. That's about, that's about it. And just repeat it over and over. Pastor Stephen, it sounds boring. Yes, it's gigantically boring. <laughs> That's the whole purpose of fasting. It humbles your soul. And um, it also, of course, you're still not going to have the energy, the, the strength that you would normally have. But you want to make sure that you also take time to pray. So I just want to encourage you today. God's grace is on your life. Thank you for your prayers again so much. Thank you for your love and your support. And I believe that this is the greatest year of your life thus far. Okay, now go forth and speak those good things. Find those scriptures that build up your faith. Speak them. Stay on it. Talk to the mountains. And by the time I see you again, I wouldn't be surprised if there's maybe a smaller mountain or two that's already been sunk in the depth of the ocean and it's out of your life. Okay, maybe even a big one. God bless you. See you back again real soon. Bye-bye.